All right, we're, we're good. We ready? We ready? All right. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh do want to start with prayer requests. Uh, be praying for uh, Clark Shepard and, uh, and Brian. Uh, Clark is Brian's dad, not, not doing good in hospice care. Um, also be praying for the Krings. Uh, Jennifer had a cousin that committed suicide um, this past week, so be praying for that family. Anybody else have prayer requests? Guys just coming in, outlines are in the seat there. <laughs> right on, right on. Anybody? If not, let's go ahead and pray, and then we'll get, we'll get started. Father God, thank you for this day, and thank you for all your many blessings. Uh, Lord, we thank you for your love, your mercy, your kindness. Uh, Lord, we just thank you for your word, and as we study it tonight, Lord, we pray that you would use it to draw us closer to you, give us understanding, and uh, Lord, comfort us. Uh, Lord, convict us where we need it, and Lord, I pray that you would just be with the Kring family. Uh, Lord, be with uh, the Shepherd family. Lord, be with Brian and Clark. Uh, Lord, be with those that we have that are traveling, those who are hurting, those who are grieving and mourning. Uh, Lord, we ask that you would just continue to bless our church and add to it as you see fit. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um, quick uh, news update. I've been out of commission all week, so thank God for one Travis Coomer and Matt Bowling. But we had a massive water leak out here over this side of the church. It's It's already been fixed. Um, but had to be remedied and has been. Um, so we might have an extremely high water bill this next coming month. So um, we believe in transparency around here. I don't know if you care about that, if you even needed to know that, but nevertheless, there it is if you want it. <laughs> if you don't know, now you know. Um, and, and there it is. Um, we're going to get started tonight. Um, we're in rightly dividing, still still talking about how we rightly divide Scripture, how we look at it in context, all those different things. But we're, we're kind of taking a break. We've been in the Gospel of John for the better part of, I don't know, six months or something like that. And um, we're talking about, you guys got to bear with me, I'm, I'm over my bubonic plague mostly, but still not all the way. Um, turns out it wasn't COVID, it wasn't flu, it was some kind of mystery virus, and I don't know what that was, so, um, oh well. But um, we're looking at, I, I asked you guys, hey, submit questions, and so this was one of the questions was um, what we're going to look at tonight. Um, what do we know and what do we see happening today that is in the Bible, or are those things paralleled even? Um, so that that's kind of where we're going to be at tonight. And this isn't by any stretch an exhaustive list. It's just the things that I thought would be most most pertinent. But but then there's the question of how do you know how to study some of this stuff? Well, you know, you might get a book on prophecy. You might get a commentary. You might just simply Google like stuff happening today. But but anytime you do something like that, it's a great way to to obtain information and to get stuff. But at the same time, you got to be very careful. So how do I know if I'm I'm getting and getting good information, or if it's heretical even, and and that's where we got to go back. And so, anything that you read in a book, and anything that you look at prophecy, or anything that you might Google, I know it might be shocking, but not everything that you read on the internet is true. Um, and so, we fact check it with the Bible uh, to see that if if it is true. That's you remember in this study. That's how we build doctrine. That's how we obtain a biblical worldview, that everything passes through the litmus test of Scripture. So I want to give you some things that, that I think are, are key today. Um, I think we had this in a, some of this stuff in a study, or maybe I put it in a sermon, I don't know, and, and maybe that was five years ago. I, I, I lose track of time. I have no concept of time, and now I have this, like, brain fog going on um, that I'm, I'm really on the struggle bus, so you'll have to bear with me tonight. Um, but the first one that I think that is important is, um, or, or something that I see in the Scripture um, that is very, very polarizing in our in our country and our culture today is, is that of of lawless, and and so we we look at the world that we live in and and we see this this cry of defund the police and and you see criminals being let free and 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 all these different types of things. Like I remember, like last summer when those um, peaceful or mostly peaceful protests went down, it was like um, there were. Uh, burning buildings, and I think they did, I think the statistic is $2.8 billion worth of damage, um, but there was no prosecutions. It was, it was, it was, it was wonky. It was wonky. Um, even things that growing up, 
um, it, it, our criminal justice system is, is beyond hard to understand in the sense that you've got somebody that does like a blue collar crime and they go to jail, but meanwhile, like drug offenders and stuff, it's like, well, now our tax dollars are going to pass out crack pops and that doesn't make a lot of sense to me, but it is nevertheless something that Jesus talked about would be uh, biblical. So you would see this time, um, another reference verse would be Isaiah chapter 5 verse 20, that there's this time coming when they will call good evil, evil good, sweet bitter, bitter sweet. Um, and, and that's almost the day and age that we live in. But, but Jesus doubled down on it in the New Testament narrative in Matthew 24. He started talking about in context, because context is important. That's one of the things that we talk about in this study. In, in context, um, Jesus' disciples come and ask him, hey, what are some things that we should be looking for for the coming um, age? And so Jesus goes into this dissertation. This is uh, theologically, it's referred to as the Olivet Discourse. Um, and there's some rich stuff there, and you probably remember that from our prophecy study, from our revelation study. Um, but Jesus goes through this big list, and he talks about, like, you're going to see wars and rumors of wars, and nations going to be rising against nation, and kingdom is going to be rising against kingdom. And you're going to see famine, and you're going to see pestilence, and you'll see all this stuff. But look at what else he says in verse 12. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will go crow, grow cold. And so what Jesus is saying is that you're going to see love on the decrease, and you're going to see lawlessness on the increase. In other words, it'll be, a, it'll be a time when crime rates will be probably at an all-time high. Um, the Apostle Paul kind of gave us insight on that in 2 Timothy 3. And he talks about like in the last days, perilous or dangerous times will come. And then he goes into the list um, that, that gets the most attention for men will be lovers of themselves more than lovers of God, uh, haughty, high-minded, uh, without natural affection, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. He goes through this big, big, long, exhaustive list of some attitudes um, and behaviors that you will see in the last days. But, but if you want to, even right now, get your phone and look at the, the crime rate in New York City or Chicago. And what you'll find is around the major metropolitan uh, cities in the United States in our country, uh, murder rates and rapes and violent crime and assault, they're at all-time highs. Gun violence, all these things are at, at all-time highs. It's shattering records. And we gotta, we got to kind of step back from that and ask, okay, like, why is that happening? And it's because love is on the de decrease, lawlessness is on the increase, and this is exactly what the Bible says. Uh, look at 2 Thessalonians 2, 7-9. For the mystery of, and we see that word again, lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one. Now, if you remember from our Revelation study and our prophecy study, the lawless one is who? Antichrist. That's exactly right. One will be revealed whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one, so it talks about it again, is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders. So the Bible actually talks about, and the Bible says in, in, in the book of 1 John, that the, the spirit of Antichrist is already at work, and so we know that, okay, if it was at work then, it's at work now, and this is one of those spirits of Antichrist, is that you will see lawlessness like there will be a, a total disregard for that which is moral, for that which is good, um, for that which is, is sacred, for that which is holy. For oftentimes, what is that commonsensical? Um, in other words, like as a believer in Christ Jesus, you will more and more feel like a stranger in a strange land, and you will sit back and you will be like, how is, how is that okay, whatever that is? And the answer will be, it is with the culture, but it's not with the Word of God. And so the closer that we get to the coming of the Lord Jesus, the more and more lawlessness um, that you will see. So the second one that I have here, and I'm, not gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna do quick hitters. Um, if you have questions at the end, we'll talk about those. But, but we covered a lot of this, especially in the prophecy and the revelation study. But number two, transportation and knowledge will be on the increase, okay? So for this, we go to the Old Testament. Let's look first at, at Daniel 12.4. But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal up the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. And so this is painting a picture. If you know anything about Daniel 12, this is Daniel's vision. And, and, and God is revealing to Daniel that in these last days, um, in the, in the quote-unquote last days, what you're going to see is you'll see an increase in travel. People going and moving about planet Earth, people moving about um, the, the verbiage that the Bible uses is to and fro, to and from, where and to, to and where. Um, they, they just keep 
moving around. And honestly, whether you're talking about uh, planes, trains, or automobiles, travel um, is easier now than it's ever been at any point in time in human history. Um, whether you want to talk about um, the invention of the automobile or the steam engine um, or, or planes or commercial flights or I mean, you can you can pick a way if you if you and your family have made vacation plans and you're deciding to go to Florida, you can get there by a number of different options in a number of different ways, and you can be there uh, fairly quickly. And and this is this is there in, there are entire industries, billion with a B dollar industries that are made up of travel and vacations and travel and travel and you can get there quick and you can get there effectively but it also says and knowledge shall increase so you're not just looking at a time in the last days when transportation is on the increase and people are moving about planet earth um, quicker and more effectively and efficiently than they ever have in human history but it is also a time when knowledge is on the rise where where knowledge will be easier and easier and easier and where you can get information and knowledge can be accessed and disseminated very quickly and and I think that this is true in our society with not only the public education field and if you want an education then you can get an education and it can it can be as good uh, as you want to make it then also um, advanced education and furthering education and and when you think about like okay the things that like we got we talk about higher education you can go to college and it doesn't matter from what socioeconomic class that you're from uh, you can get grants and you can get student loans and you can get I mean now it's to the point to where it's like man I don't have time to actually take time out of my day and go to college then you can sit at your house and you can watch college on your computer, your iPhone, or your iPad, um, even if if you think about like you're saying like, well, I just have one question. I just want to know what was the day when George Washington was inaugurated president of the United States. You can pull out your phone and Google that right now, and it will tell you, right? I mean, we live in a day and age where information is easily, at, at, at more than any point in history, it is easily obtained, and it is even easier disseminated. And so, but just because knowledge is on the increase doesn't mean that people are going to arrive at the truth. And this is where things get really wonky. And, and, and if, you're, if you're like me, you, you sometimes watch these things happening in real time and you're going to be, you're, you're almost scratching your head going, is this real life right now? Like, is this really what they're saying? Like, is this really happening and taking place? And, and you're like, how could... How could educated, intelligent people arrive at the fact of questioning like whether something is biologically male or female? That doesn't make any sense. Well, here's, here's the answer. 2 Timothy 3, 7, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of what? The truth. And so just because, just because knowledge is on the increase, the Bible is actually painting a picture here that just because people are getting smarter and smarter and smarter, sometimes they can get so smart they become dumb. <laughs> and so this is, this is twofold. Number one, you've got knowledge going up, but people are never able to ar arrive at the knowledge of the truth. Now, this is where it's twofold. I think the Bible is talking about two different truths here. Number one, you've got the truth of soteriology, the doctrine of salvation. In other words, they will get smarter and smarter and smarter and smarter and smarter, and intelligence is going up, and transportation is going up, and people are able to move about the country to and fro, and you've got Google, and you've got university, and you've got college, and you've got the Pell Grant, and you've got student loans, and right now, if you want in education, the only thing standing in the way is you, right? But just because people are doing that doesn't mean they're ever going to arrive at the truth, like Jesus Christ is the truth, John 14, 6. Like, that doesn't mean that they're going to arrive at the conclusion that Jesus Christ is Lord and that he's the only way to heaven. It also, I think, is pointing to the fact that that they will not be able to come to simplistic, everyday, common sense, scientific, always been true truth. Romans one twenty one. if you know anything about Romans chapter 1, I challenge you to go home and read this, read it and study it all in context. I don't have time to break it all down tonight. Uh, but but this, is what, this is what the context of Romans uh, 1 is. It actually teaches against those without natural affection. And he says in Romans one twenty two. 
professing themselves to be wise, so they, they are intelligent, they are, they are what the world would call educated, they are esteemed, they are, they are wise, they are here, they actually became what? Fools. You know, just because something seems smart or has the appearance of intelligence, again, this is the entire premise for, for the Bible, for the student, for the Word of God, for the student of the Word of God, uh, for the believer, is that I don't just adapt to whatever, and you'll remember this from the apologetic study, um, truth is in culture malleable. Uh, laws, you've got to come to this point to where you say, okay, what is truth? Because I share this with every agnostic and atheist that I get. It's like, okay, what is morality? Then how do you define morality? Uh, is it okay that I go out and kill somebody? Well, no, you can't do that. That's wrong. Okay, says who? Well, says me. Okay, so morality is left up to the individual. So you say that it's wrong. Ted Bundy thought it was a thrill. Right? Well, yeah, that makes sense. Well, government, okay, government, cool. Our government says that that's wrong, and we even break down all the different wrong ways that it is to kill somebody, and you got premeditated murder, and murder in the first degree, and second degree murder, and third degree murder, and manslaughter, and vehicular manslaughter. I mean, we actually, we've actually broken it down. All, at the end of the day, all of them in the same way, somebody died, and it's my fault. <laughs> well, government, Okay, cool, but the U.S. has this standard, but right now Russia has a different one, and we're not even talking about Pol Pot, North Vietnam, or the Third Reich, and Hitler had a much different, like he was a government, but he said it was okay to kill people as long as they were those people and not his people. At the end of the day, amen if you understand, you've got to come, and so for the believer, it's like that's the reason I, I preach this, I teach this so passionately is because this is what I have, and this is what I decide is truth. And so God says in his word, Isaiah, you're not supposed to kill anybody. Cool. That's the end of it for me. <laughs> and, and so this, this is the day and the age and the culture that we live in, is if you think about it, things are in a perpetual state of metamorphosis all the time. And it's like, well, laws change. You're right, laws do change. So what, is, what was truth? Like, and, and this is an overused illustration by me as your pastor, but I went to school with Lindsey Wilson in college, and I drove the parkway all the time. And my brother-in-law's, uh, or my brother's, not my brother-in-law's, I only have one brother-in-law. That's, I would call it COVID brain, but they said I didn't have COVID. I don't know. My brothers both live in Bowling Green, so I've driven the Cumberland Parkway a lot. And, and back in the day, the speed limit was 60, and there was a toll booth. Does anybody remember that? But now there's no toll booth, and it's 70. Which one was right? <laughs> now, I have my preference, but, I mean, which one was right? And this is the thing, like, whether you want to talk about, like, and, 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 and we live in a culture, like, we've got to understand this is the day and age that we're living in, is everything is feelings-based, not factual-based. And it's all about how do I feel today? And what do I feel like? When in the reality is, is, is for us, it's, it's like, man, I'm, I'm feeling weirder and weirder and weirder because it's like things are changing all the time. It's like this doesn't make any sense. And this is what the Bible says. God didn't pull any punches. This is some stuff that's happening today in our day and age that the Bible says, he says, listen, Isaiah, they're going to say they're wise, but they're actually foolish. You're going to hear some highly intelligent, educated people say some really dumb things stuff some really dumb stuff like they're ever going to be increasing in knowledge but they're never going to understand and be able to promulgate truth they're, they're going to invent all these crazy ways and they're going to be traveling everywhere and these engineers and like but 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 you got to understand this is a picture this is a sign of the last days number three tech uh, you'll remember this uh, maybe in our revelation what was the last i see it seems like that was yesterday how long has that been has that been a minute? Two years? Okay. Man, it seems like it was just a month or so ago. But again, I lose track of time. But, but technology. Um, and, and let's look at Revelation eleven nineteen. And, and, and this goes back to the apologetic study because somebody always like, was like, well, why doesn't the Bible use the word technology? Because the word technology wasn't invented. It's kind of like when you go back to the Old Testament and, you're, and, and people are like, well, why doesn't the Bible talk about dinosaurs? Well, because the word dinosaur wasn't invented until like the 1860s and 
God's word was completed well before then. But you do find creatures like Behemoth and Leviathan, and you start reading about those creatures like, eh, that sounds like a dinosaur, bro. That's because it is, <laughs> right? And, and so when you, when you start, like, why doesn't the Bible talk about technology? Well, the Bible doesn't use the word technology or iPhone or, uh, I don't know, iPod. or I mean, I thought it was a big deal in my day when we had Discmans. Y'all remember Discmans? You put the CD in the little miniature CD player, and you had these headphones. Um, but, man, that's antiquated now. I feel weird when I, Brandy just got me for Christmas, or, or birthday one, one of those wireless headphones that you put around your ear, and now I'm somebody, but every now and then I forget to charge them, and I have to go back to the little cord that plugs into my phone. <laughs> and, and I've got this buddy at the gym. He came up to me a couple weeks ago. He's like, man, you got to, that's cramping your style. And I'm like, I don't, I, I don't really have a style. But, but again, like, what does the Bible say about technology? So here, this isn't an exhaustive list, but I want you to look, Revelation 11:9. Um, in context, we're talking about the two witnesses uh, that are going to be sent uh, to prophesy. And, and basically, if you remember the Revelation study, here's the long and short of it. God sends them to proclaim his word and, and his testimony. And at the three and a half year mark, um, they're killed right in the middle of the tribulation. And so that's what we're talking about in context here in Revelation 11 is the, the death of, of God's two witnesses. Now, notice what the Bible says. And they... Of all the people and kindreds and tongues and nations. Now, this is an important phrase. If you make notes in your Bibles or whatever, circle this. Shall see. All right? Their dead bodies three days and a half and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in the graves. So, in other words, what the Bible is saying here is that these two witnesses' dead bodies will lay in the street for three and a half days. And... The entire world, that's the picture we're given. People of every nation, people of every kindred, people of every tongue, people, people all over planet Earth will actually visibly see. That's what that word means. They will see their dead bodies laying in the streets. Now, if you get hold of a commentary um, from, say, the 1800s, uh, early 1900s, nobody understood how this would happen. Um, and you, you can find it. It's actually fascinating to read about. Um, I've done this before. And you can go back and you can read some antiquated Matthew Henry commentary. And you can read about what these men said. And they said, I don't know how it's going to happen. But I believe by faith that God said it. Therefore, it will happen. Now, do you think it would be possible, even with the transportation that we have today, to transport every single person on planet Earth to the city of Jerusalem and form a massive line and let them one by one come through and look at it? Like, no. But it is very possible if, say, I were there on scene and I just pulled out my phone and then took a picture of it or a three-second or a 30-second video and then tweeted it and Facebooked it and YouTubed it and <laughs> I don't really have any more. Uh, Instagrammed it? <laughs> is, that, is, that, <laughs> is that a thing? Snapchatted it? <laughs> um, <laughs> you all can tell I'm a hipster. I have all these things. Um, but... Now it's very possible to get that around the entirety of the world, and I don't know that it would take three and a half days. We call it today, um, you've heard this phrase, a video goes viral. In other words, there's thousands and millions of people that see it in a short time, and it's shared and it's shared and it's shared and it's shared and shared. And so now we, we live in a day and age where if you think about it, your grandparents, maybe your great-grandparents, they read this verse and they were like, how in the world would that be possible? We live in a day and age where we're going, I don't know that it would take three and a half days. Like, it, it could be three and a half hours. It could be like the, the cable net television networks and, and all the media and, and, and technology that we have. And again, this goes, back to, this goes back to what we were just talking about. Knowledge has increased. Technology has increased. It could be all the way around the world in a matter of seconds. Um, fourth, um, the, the following, and that's not to mention... Um, you know, the way that we can even uh, do like um, um, uh, monetary exchanges, um, you know, in, in one world currency and all that stuff, that also answers that question um, because now we have debit cards and we have electronic banking and we have cryptocurrency and we have all these different things that, that I mean, it's, it's very possible. But number four, falling away, Second Thessalonians 2 um, and so what, what, the entire, what this entire chapter is about, and, and, and a lot of this book 
um, was that apparently in context, these were a peoples, um, a group, a church um, that had kind of been sold a bill of goods. They had, I guess, apparently been under the impression that the rapture had already taken place and, and they had missed it. And, and so Paul is writing to them and, and reminding them um, as a church of some things that he shared with them and told them and taught them um, when he was there with them. And so he reminds them of this, and he, he, he talks a great deal uh, about some different things that will happen. But, but the first thing that he says uh, will happen, it comes in verse 3. He says, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. That's, that's Antichrist. But the first thing that happens is Paul says there will be this day of a falling away. Now, uh, transliteration, you're looking at where we get our word apostasy. And the more that you study this word and the more that you understand its meaning, um, the more significant it becomes is that there's going to be a day um, in these last days when you will see people abandon the faith at breakneck speed. And not only abandon the faith, but just not take it very seriously. Um, it'll be a hobby. Um, you will see entertainment up. You will see self-love up. It'll be all about what I want. It'll be about all what I want to do. And this, again, goes back to Paul's letter to Timothy. And I think I think this is in the sermon Sunday. Um, for in the last days, perilous times shall come. The very first thing on the list, for men shall be lovers of themselves uh, more than lovers of God. Um, and then it actually concludes with that, like it, with that same thought is that what you're looking for is a time when I could do something for God, but I'd rather kind of do something for me. Like, yeah, I could go to church, but I'd rather go out on the lake. Like, I know that thing's coming up, but, man, I like this recliner. Like, well, do you want to go to church today? Well, I mean, if nothing else is going on, but UK is about to play North Carolina at 8, and I don't know if we'll be home in time like <laughs> it'll be a time when when people don't have a servant's heart because they've got a selfish one where where they've they're they're willing to toss aside justify lay down throw away it becomes all about it if you read this in context and I really I mean I we taught through this when we were going through, I think, the Revelation study or maybe the prophecies, or maybe both. But, but what you're looking at is you're looking at it, what Paul's describing in 2 Thessalonians 2 and in his letter to Timothy, and you put all these Pauline epistles together, and what you're looking at is a time where faith is down and fun is up. And, and what you're looking at is a time that says, like, well, I know what God says and I know what God's standards are, but I would rather take feelings, my feelings, over the facts of Scripture. And, and you're going to be living in a time to where standards and morality and character and just different things. And if you look back, I mean, this is, this is fascinating to me, but also incredibly alarming. Things that were okay or, or that are okay now, your grandmother and grandpa could not imagine in, in a million years, they, they wouldn't be caught dead thinking, watching, seeing. And now it's stuff that we've just become so enamored with. And so it, it's just, it's just well, that's just the way the world is. It's just what it is. And, and, and slowly, this is the process that begins to happen. It's a, it's a slow fade. And this is, this is what the Bible is describing, is that there will be a time when you'll see people that, they can take it or leave it. Either is fine. There'll be a time of falling away. It's, it's, it's fading and fading and fleeting and fading and fleeting and fading and fleeting and fading until the point to where you get and you're like, I don't even recognize what this is anymore. And this is what Paul's describing. And this is the day and age that I live. We're blessed here. As I talk to so many other pastors and, and church attendance is on, I mean, Google this stuff and read about it. Church attendance is at an all-time low even in the Bible Belt where we live. It's absolutely, it's, it's alarming. And, and so this is, this is one of the things that he talks about is a fading away, a revolt, a rebellion a, away from the faith. No conviction, no morality, no values, no standards. I'll do what I want, when I want, how I want, and I don't care. I don't care who gets hurt. 
I don't care whose feelings I stomp on. I don't care what the standard is. I, I don't want that. I don't, I'm not worried about the commitment I made. I'm not, I don't, I don't care. I can miss church and I don't care. I cannot go on the mission. I don't care. They, they have any, I don't, listen, let somebody else do it. <laughs> this is, this is what I think Paul's describing in this fading, this, this falling away, this time of apostasy. And then I think it goes a step further. I think that you'll actually see, and because Paul talks about this in his letter to Timothy, he says, and I didn't have room to put all these verses on your outline, he said, for the time will come when they'll not endure sound doctrine, but they'll heap to themselves fables and stories, and they want to have itching ears. In other words, you're going to get to a point in time to where the average pastor can't even preach the Word of God because it's going to be offensive to people, and people are going to be offended, and they'll have that. I cannot believe you would say that to me. It's like, well, listen, I'm not, I'm not trying to offend you, but the Bible just says this, you know. And, and this, is, this is the day. This is the attitude, and, and this, is, this is the time, and this, and this is what Paul's describing. He says that they're gonna, there's going to come a time when, when you, you, might, you might watch a sermon, and it might be three YouTube videos, and, and somebody read a, a, a three verses and just say, well, everybody have a good week. See you next time, you know. Don't forget the pizza party tonight at 5. You know, that, that might be kind of what you're looking at. Um, there'll be a time when, when, when the church in totality may not care about the needs in the community. They may not, it, it doesn't matter. Like, it, it's just about what we want. Like, this is reference to the time of the judges, and Jesus likened it to the days of Noah. It's a time when they're crying peace and safety. Everything's fine. Everything's cool, right? Um, but they have no idea that it's about to come as travail upon a woman. Like, it, it's, it's uncertainty. And then you got Russia and war. Um, and this is something very pertinent that I think um, is happening um, today. Um, if you watch the news and um, you've been alive for more than five minutes, um, you, you're accustomed to war. And it seems like we're living in a more violent time frame. And this is the verse that I referenced earlier, a part of it, um, the Olivet Discourse. Jesus says this in verse 6 of Matthew 24. Um, and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. <laughs> See that you are not troubled. <laughs> Again, he's talking to a people that are believers. They understand. And so Jesus is saying like, now, don't misunderstand. There is a difference. I was having this conversation tonight, uh, or tonight, tonight, just this week with somebody. And they're like, do you see this stuff that's happening? I'm like, yeah. And they're like, what do you think about it? And I'm like, I don't like it, but it, I'm not shocked by it. I mean, like, it bothers me in the sense that I don't want people dying. And, and, but, but, I mean, I, I, I would be lying if I didn't say as a person that tries to study the Bible that I, I didn't see it coming. I'm going to show you this. And that's the reason Jesus said this. Like, don't, don't be shaken. Don't be alarmed. Like, this stuff has to happen. Look what he says. For all these things must, M-U-S-T, they must come to pass, but the end is not yet. What is it? It's a warm-up. And so people say, like, do you think we're living in the last days? I, I don't know. I don't know when the, I don't, nobody does. And anybody that tells you they do know and they set a date, just immediately assume that person's a liar because the Bible says, Jesus said, for the day and the time, no man knows. It's not for, he even told the disciples, the disciples thought, well, we're close with Jesus. We're like besties. Like, surely he'll tell us, like, Jesus, when will these things be? And when is the arrival of the kingdom? And he tells them point blank, it's not for you to know the times and the seasons. I'm not telling you either, guys. It, all means all, everyone means everybody. You don't get to know, I don't get to know, you don't get to know, nobody knows. But here's what I do think is that when I step back and I look at the things happening in our world today and I look at the attitude and I look at the culture and I look at everything that I see happening around me, I don't know that we're at halftime, I don't know whether we're in overtime, but I think you can make a strong case we're in the layup line and we're warming up. Like it's, it's, getting, it's, getting, it's getting close. But here's the thing that I know, just through deductive reasoning, we're closer See, we start a Bible study at 6.30. We're 34 minutes closer now to the eternal. Like, I don't know if you've ever thought about that, but with every passing moment and second, we move closer to that thing, all right? And so this is what he says. The end is not yet. So we think about all the war, wars and all the arguing and all the fighting and all the all-out war. And just the last century, it's saw two world wars, um, Vietnam, Korea, war on terror, war in Afghanistan, Operation De Desert Storm. We even declared a war on drugs. Like it didn't work, but we declared war on it. Um, there's been a lot of war. 
And even now as you watch the news cycles and you're seeing this stuff play out, you see, you see all these things that are happening with, with Russia and Ukraine. And, and, I, and I want to take a minute and show you this. Um, Bob, will you go ahead and put up the picture? Can we put up the picture? There it is. Okay. So everybody just hold tight on this a minute. So we're going to talk about this. But has anybody ever heard the phrase or the phraseology from, from the Bible, Gog and Magog? Anybody ever heard that? So let's, let's look at what the Bible says about this. You find this in two places, okay? Now, again, we're, we're talking about rightly dividing, so I want to, uh, you, you go home, study this, but here's what I would tell you as your pastor. You're looking at the book of Revelation, um, and, you're, and you're looking at Ezekiel 38 and 39. Now, the event that you're looking at in Ezekiel 38 and 39 and the event that you're looking at in Revelation are two different events, and they're two separate time periods. Um, one is after the rapture of the church, and one comes definitely before of it, but you've got the same spirit, and you've got the same attitude. It's the same geographical location, but even the way that they come in to invade is, is in a different direction. That's a different lesson for a different time. But I want you to look at Genesis chapter 10, um, 1 and 2 is the first time that we come across this phrase, um, Gog, and, uh, or Magog, okay? So like Genesis 10, 1 and 2, now this is the genealogy of the sons of Noah, uh, Shem, Ham, and I, you all know me, I was raised in Keno, and I, I, I have some diplomas. I say that as Japheth. And I will always say that as Japheth because it starts with a J. But just in <laughs> education, it's my job to equip you and to educate you. It's actually pronounced in Hebrew with a Y. Amen, if you understand. Um, it is, so it would be Yahef. <laughs> That's Hebrew. But I'm not going to say Yahef because I don't talk like that. So I say Japheth. That's just... That's just where we're at in the world. And, and I, can, I, can, I can say, like, I'm going to do better. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say, yeah, and, and I won't. I'll say, Japheth, because <laughs> I don't speak fluent Hebrew. Uh, and the sons were born to them after the flood. The sons of, <laughs> can I, I'll remember it for this time, yeah, uh, were Gomer and Magog, uh, Madai, uh, Javan, Tubal, Meshech, and Tyrus. And so here's what we're looking at. We're looking at the descendants of Noah. And of course, um, the flood comes. The entirety of the earth is destroyed. Only Noah, his sons, the inhabitants on the ark, are set to repopulate the earth. And so we came across Magog. And that is where just north of the Caspian Sea, uh, just in between uh, Europe, or what we refer to as the European Union, a lot of those NATO uh, countries, and on the other side, Asia, is where the land of uh, Magog um, is. That's, that's where it's at. And so this is, again, we get into semantics and linguistics, and it's like, well, yeah, but pastor of the Bible doesn't say anything about Russia. No, it doesn't, because when the Bible was written, Russia wasn't a thing. It was called the land of Magog. <laughs> Amen, if you understand. Right? Um, it, it, it was at one point in time called the land of Canaan, not Israel. And now if you study out what the promised land was, you, you, you can't just look at the nation, i.e. when you look at a map, a modern day map of Israel, it actually would encompass Israel. It would encompass Jordan. It would actually encompass like Palestine. Like it, it's bigger um, than what it is now. So things, things change and things get different. Another example of this, and, and I got this in my notes, um, would be, um, it's, it's almost semantical, um, but it would be like Armageddon, and you might remember this from the Revelation study, is when, when somebody's talking about something that is like um, catastrophically bad, they'll refer to it as like, it's in like an Armageddon um, situation. Well, Armageddon actually is in the Bible, it's Revelation 16, 16, and they gathered together to the place in Hebrew called Armageddon, um, but really, it's it's not an event as well as a lo as much as a location. Um, and in Hebrew, what you're looking at here, and this is this is the Greek or the, the English translation, Armageddon, it would be pronounced Har and it was literally like 
the mountain of God, like the Mount of Megiddo. It is the it is Har Mount Megiddo, Mount Megiddo, the Valley uh, of Megiddo, the Jezreel Valley that runs through there. That is, it's the location, not an event. This is the same thing and the same premise that we're dealing with here. We are dealing with a geographical location rather than we are an actual event. So I, I hear people talk about this sometimes and it's like I just want to be like, eh, yeah, that's not exactly right, but okay. Um, but but they talk about it like it's an, a, an event um, when actually it's, it's, it's a location. And so Ezekiel 38 and 39, we get into this Gog and Magog um, uh, futuristic prophecy. And so this is what um, the Bible says, let's look at Ezekiel 38, 1 through 5. Now, if you want to know this in totality, read Ezekiel 38 and 39. Uh, now, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, set your face against Gog and the land of Magog. And so, this is the thing that you've got to understand. Magog, again, is a geographical location. Um, Gog is a, a person um, or the leader of or the prince of or the ruler of this geographical location i.e. Uh, Magog, okay? And so the prince of Rosh, uh, Meshach, and Tubal, and prophesy against them and say, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. I will turn you around, put hooks into your jaws, and lead you out with all your army, horses and horsemen, all splendidly clothed, a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. Persia, Ethiopia, and Libya are with them, all of them with shield and helmet. And so there are, if you get online, again, uh, Google is great, but don't believe everything you see on Google. And, and some of this gets into what I would refer to as theoretical theology. And so some of this is, is I mean, you can point like that's the land of Magog. But then you start reading articles on this. There's people that go way down the rabbit hole. And they're like, oh, oh, Rosh. Like Rosh, that sounds a lot like Russia. And it's like, well... You know, dog sounds a lot like Gog, but I don't draw a parallel there. But, I mean, okay, whatever. I mean, it's just one of those things. So just like like I said, be careful what you read. Revelation 20 um, is a different war. But what you're dealing with here is the Bible making a prophecy about the land or the inhabitant or the leader of this region, uh, Magog, um, and its leader trying to cause people that are to the south of Magog or accompanying um problems specifically here Israel and so like I said you know if you were here in the prophecy study the revelation study the Bible talks about the kings of the east now again we're in theological theology I can't say um, this with certainty like there was a man named Nicodemus that came to Jesus by night saying at John chapter 3 but again most scholars most theologians refer to that as China but apparently there's an entity, a superpower that's in the east that will, when the Euphrates River drives up, they'll come against Israel. And this seems to be what the Bible is referring to here. This land of Magog um, will certainly come against um, Israel. And so what you're going to see, in, in my opinion, in the way that I interpret Scripture, and this is, again, some stuff that's my interpretation, theoretical theology. Um, some of it is certain fact. That's the land of Magog. You read Genesis chapter 10. There it is. Um, but... Um, Here's what I think that we are looking for and ramping up for. I think that you're going to see China uh, get more and more and more and more and more and more and more powerful. I think that you're going to see Russia get more and more and more and more and more powerful. And the entities around. <laughs> there was a picture up there a minute ago, right? Okay. You're <laughs> Bob, you're messing with my COVID brain. Um, no, I love you, man. I'm messing with you. Uh, you're going to see the, the people from Magog in that area. And, and from Magog over to the right, in my opinion, you're going to see them grow more and more powerful. Now, here's where I think, for me personally, when I will sit up and go, we're getting, we're getting real close, is if you start hearing and seeing stuff in the news that those entities – those nations, those land masses, whether it's China and whether my theoretical theology is long, but some entity or superpower from the east starts making threats against Israel. If you hear any superpower, any entity in the land of Magog um, making threats and putting Israel in their sights, um, I think you're getting, I think you're getting real close. Um, and I, again, we're dealing with, does anybody know the day? Does anybody know the hour? No, but that is, that is one of the things to be watching for 
uh, in upcoming times. Um, that's all I got. Anybody, I know that was a lot. Any questions or comments? That was an exhaustive list, but I think that would, does that answer the question? I remember whose question that was, but anyways, I had fun. So, um, again, you're looking at um, Israel, and Israel's not on the map. So if you want to pull up your phone, um, on your phone, a map of Israel, and then if you, like, put in Israel and then put in Mount Megiddo, um, that's where um, Mount Megiddo would be. Uh, right there, geographically, it's right in the Jezreel Valley. That would be where Mount Megiddo is. M-E-G-I-D-D-O, I think. I didn't do very good on my seminary spelling test, Mom. I'm sorry. <laughs> I spelled Job right every time. <laughs> what's, what's that, Kim? Yes. And if you remember, there, oftentimes people refer to it as the battle of Armageddon, and it's, it's really not a battle. Um, you'll remember what, what is happening there in the biblical narrative is all these nations are coming against Israel. Again, this is, this is the last. This is before the second coming. You've got all these nations. Um, the Bible prophesies there that the river Euphrates will dry up, and when the river Euphrates dries up, the kings of the east cross the Euphrates River, um, the land of Magog, and all these entities and all these different armies, they're coming to um, and meeting at the Valley of Jezreel to come out and fight against the people of God, against Israel. And at that point in time, that's when you have the second coming. Jesus returns on the white course. We, uh, the heavenly host comes down to meet him in there. And the Bible says he destroys them um, with the word of his mouth. So in other words, he's just going to probably speak something and they all kind of spontaneously combust. As messed up, and usually the illustration I get is if you've ever seen Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade when the Germans look in the ark. Um, and they kind of go, you know, and they're, that, that's kind of what I think it'll be like. But the Bible says that the, the blood in that valley will, will run horse bridle deep. So it's, it's really not a battle. Like, I don't, Jesus just says something and they all die. So that's, that's pretty much it. Anybody else? If not. Um, I meant to tell some dad jokes, but I forgot my phone. <laughs> um, let me see if I can remember one. <laughs> no, <laughs> don't <laughs> hold on. I had uh, Miss Leanne sent me so many good ones. Give me a good one, Leanne. You sent me so many this week. I didn't bring my phone. What was the one about the cat? Mm. Yeah, what, what do you get when you cross a cat and a tomato? Tell them, Leanne. <laughs> to Meowto. <laughs> that's, that's so bad. That's, oh, oh. Oh, I love those too much. Hey, listen, church, I love you. Everybody have a good week. Tell somebody about Jesus this week. Uh, invite somebody to come to church with you next week. Let's, let's pray it out. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for this day. Uh, Lord, we thank you so much for your word. Lord, for the, for the clarity that it brings, for the truth it contains, and Lord, for the comfort that it is. Um, Lord, we just ask that, um, Lord, as long as we're here, that you would put people in our path that we can tell about you. Um, Lord, that we can demonstrate your love and your kindness to and toward um, Lord, I thank you for your grace, your forgiveness, your mercy, uh, Lord, for the way that you have blessed this church and you continue to, uh, Lord, so we just ask that you would continue to bless, uh, provide, be with our mission team that will be leaving Friday, watch over them, watch over those in our church who will be traveling, um, Lord, comfort those who are hurting, and Lord, we ask that you would heal those who are sick. We love you, we thank you for all you do, and it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.